Greetings and hello. Welcome to National Invasive Species Awareness Week, powered by the North American Invasive Species Management Association. My name is Elizabeth Brown, and I am your Legislative Affairs, Professional Development, and Certified Weed-Free Products Program Manager here at NASMA. I am delighted to have you here today for the fourth webinar in our series titled Science, Policy, and Solutions for Invasive Species, also known as the Plant Health Webinar. NISA is an international event to raise awareness about invasive species, the threats they pose, and what can be done to prevent their spread. Representatives from local, state, federal, and regional organizations gather with non-governmental organizations and private industry to discuss legislation, policies, and improvements that can be made to prevent and manage invasive species. We are continuing on today with an outstanding lineup of daily webinars. There is also a downloadable turnkey resource toolkit available on our website, nisa.org, for your use. Okay, before we get to our first presentation, I'd like to introduce NASMA to those of you that don't know us well. So our mission here at NASMA is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. So a little bit about what we do. Education and advocacy is a large part of what we do. And here, National Invasive Species Awareness Week, twice a year in February and in May. Outreach and awareness, our public-facing campaign, Play Clean Go. Please check it out at playcleango.org. We have Play Clean Go Awareness Week happening in June, and there are a lot of tools available. At NASMA, we promote international standards, such as our mapping standards and our certified weed-free product standards for forage, gravel, and mulch. And professional development is also a huge chunk of what we do here at NASMA. We have an Invasive Species Manager Certification Program, a course. We also offer free monthly webinars, so check out our series online. And then, of course, our annual conference. So save the date, September 27th through 30th, 2021 in Missoula, Montana, our annual conference. And we will offer a virtual option, a hybrid option for those that are unable to travel. If you're not a member of NASMA, I invite you to visit our website at nasma.org and check out our individual membership options. We have three options available. We also have four partnership opportunities available and we will customize partnership opportunities if you're interested in that. One of my favorite membership benefits is our first Friday event. I invite you, all of the members that are on the webinar today, and if you're not a member, sign up and join us on March 5th for our March 1st Friday event. This is being hosted by NASMA's IDEA Committee, which stands for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility. And we have a, a great program for you. Okay, so again, our mission here at NASMA is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. Please check us out at nasma.org. All right, let's get right to our main event here, our NISA webinar. We have three expert panelists here for you today. Three presentations. The first one is titled, The Illinois Invasive Species Council Past and Present, and will be presented by Tricia Bethke, Illinois Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator with the Morton Arboretum and also our chair of the NISA subcommittee. So we're very appreciative of Trisha's leadership within NASMA and our legislative committee. Our second presentation is titled The Impacts of Insects and Disease on Carbon Sequestration, presented by Brendan Quirion with Cornell University. And our third presentation is titled The Tree Smart Trade, How to Prevent Invasive Forest Pests and Pathogens from Entering the U.S., presented by Gary Lovett, Senior Scientist Emeritus at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. Please be sure to put your questions in the Q&A box. We will hold all of the questions till after the three presentations. So again, put your questions in the Q&A box and let us know who the question is for. That will just help us. And then we'll have a Q&A round at the end of the webinar. And with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Trisha Bethke with the Morton Arboretum. Trisha is the Illinois Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator. 
Her position is funded through a cooperative grant with USDA APHIS and the Morton Arboretum. Trisha's responsibilities include statewide education, training, and outreach to key stakeholders on the USDA APHIS Hungry Pest Program, forest pest identification, high-risk pathways, regulations and quarantines, and reporting protocols. Trisha also coordinates and instructs the general public on forest pest detection and tree health monitoring. Trisha has a Master's of Science in Natural Resources and Environmental Studies from the uh, University of Illinois. Trisha's presentation is titled The Illinois Invasive Species Council Past and Present. Well, welcome everybody. I am so delighted to be here with you today. This has been a, a phenomenal week of education, advocacy, information, and I think that this presentation, this panel certainly will keep up to that standard. And then we have a great presentation tomorrow afternoon. So I hope you will join us as well. As Elizabeth said, I'm the Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator for the state of Illinois. My position is funded through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, their Animal Plant Health Inspection Services, so USDA APHIS. It's funded through the Plant Protection Act. And we, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the past and the present, or almost present, Illinois Invasive Species Councils. The coordinators of NASMA asked me to present this information. Many of our members were curious as to how these Illinois, the Invasive Species Councils come about, and I wanted to share our story with you. So I will look forward to any questions that you may have at the end of our discussions. So in 2005, we're going to kind of step back and, and kind of figure out like what happened. So in 2005, the Illinois Invasive Species Council was established. It was established as a regulatory body under the Illinois Department of Natural Resources Initiative, and it reported directly to the Office of Resource Conservation Director. So it was a branch off of our Aquatic and Terrestrial Nuisance Species Tax Force. So the council itself was really, truly focused on plants only. And so I think this is where we start to uh, see what happened in the past and kind of where we are in the future or right now in the present. So plant council focused on terrestrial and aquatic invasive plants. Its structure had a chair and, and I wanna thank publicly Chris Evans. I know he gave a version of this presentation in December, so I appreciate him and I have a thank you and a shout out to him at the end of, of this presentation. But Chris Evans was the council chair and they had a 16 person voting board. So half of it was green industry and half of it was natural resource field representatives. And it was really truly focused on habitat restoration so how are these invasive plants impacting habitats within Illinois? And then how does it affect the boots on the ground, sort of that applied management piece of it? The mission was to minimize the adverse economic and ecological effects that invasive plants pose on the state of Illinois. You see our gypsy moth, our Asian carp, and our kudzu. So the mission, the goals of the, the previous council was to prepare prevent all the preventative measures, unintentional introductions, do detection, as well as have a rapid response. And then we have management as well. In 2012, one of the big initiatives was the proclamation from Governor Pat Quinn. And then we established the Illinois Invasive Species Awareness Month. And this Awareness Month, based on the proclamation, still exists today. Every year we have an annual research symposium that's held by the University of Illinois. And I would say that while we have a few events going on in, in recognition of Invasive Species Awareness Month, we definitely need more broader representation. We need more collaborative effort to support the awareness of Invasive Species Month within Illinois. So in 2007 and 2008, there was a strategic plan that was developed and enacted or put into place. And then in 2012, 2013, and then into 14, they went through a very rigorous assessment process. So 18 different plant species, both aquatic and terrestrial, were assessed, and then 16 of them were actually added to the Illinois Exotic Weed Act. Unfortunately, in 2015, everything kind of came to a standstill. The Illinois had a budget impasse and the council chair, unfortunately, was a result of that budget impasse. And the Illinois Invasive Species Council just slipped into inactivity. And it was 
sadly missed. I think it created a lot of voids. I think it allowed many of our agencies, while there always is good communication, tended to not have the focus that it should have had. And I love this picture, and I, I put it in here really truly because I think to myself, how could one tree species, calorie pear, actually get us to where we are today? And it's true, it did. We were asked by our partners in Ohio to provide some help in trying to get calorie pear regulated. And without an Invasive Species Council in place, it was really difficult to get all of the stakeholders in and get them uh, talking about what we could do potentially to address the invasiveness of calorie pear within our natural areas. And I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with calorie pear, but if you are, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There was a version of calorie pear that came out and the fruit was supposed to be sterile and then it converted back to being uh, highly invasive. So I use this as kind of a reminder to me that one tree species can actually get us moved to action. So what we did is we went through a, a planning phase. So from 2015, 2016, it was pretty quiet. And then in 2018, I had participated in an Illinois Urban Forestry Summit. And we had about 100, 150 people for about two days. And one of the questions was, you know, would you support the reconvening of Illinois Invasive Species Council? And the answer was overwhelmingly yes. But to be honest with you, there wasn't a person or an agency that was stepping forward to say, hey, I'll take this initiative on. We know everybody's plates are full. So what we did was we wrote a letter to the Illinois Forestry Development Council and we asked for their input, we asked for their guidance, and that gave us kind of a body to go back to so that we could bounce our ideas off of. We got together, we we're very transparent, we sent out many different invitations, we included as many people from all across the state in all different areas to gather to talk about the previous structure. So what worked, what didn't work. And one of the, the feedback was that it was too heavily weighted in industry and we respect our industry partners and our nursery trade. And we wanna make sure that everybody has a voice when they come to the table. We also spend a tremendous amount of time looking at other states councils. So we looked at Ohio, Indiana, Minnesota, California, New York, you name it. And what we did was we put all that information together on a spreadsheet and kind of looked at it strategically and said, what makes sense for Illinois? And then we sought out potential sponsors. We went to the Illinois Department of Agriculture. We met with the directors, Sullivan at that point, and then Callahan currently. And both agencies were very receptive of it. But if you can imagine new people coming in, new governor, new budgets, and this wasn't necessarily a priority. The feedback was, hey, you know, our folks are talking to each other. We've got a system down if something happens. You know, we think we're good to go. And there was enough people around this conversation that said, I don't think so. I think we can increase efficiency. I think we can increase applied management of invasive species but we need a clearinghouse. We need to get the stakeholders together. So we decided that we wanted to expand the council. We wanted to move it off of just being a plant council. So we decided to go all taxa. We're going to do terrestrial plants, terrestrial avian wildlife, pests and pathogens, and then aquatic life as well. So this was a big step. We got a lot of feedback. People are saying, you know, is that a little bit too much? And the group that gathered together really truly felt like, no, we could take this on. And we really wanted to make sure that we were comprehensive in our approach. The role of the council is to provide recommendations. We're looking at doing coordination across the state. We wanted to get together a team of experts so that they could respond and evaluate potential threats. We also wanted to increase 
applied science and applied management and research that's going on. We've got some really cool work that's being done in Illinois. And we want to take that science, we want to take that research, and we want to apply it. And we want to study it. And we want to be able to, to look at the council and, and, and get guidance and feedback. And also, we wanted to increase education and collaboration. That was, I think, probably a very, very big priority for this council that is hopefully about to come about. The new structure, we're going to have between 7 and 15 uh, taxa experts, we're calling them. So people that are content expert, we want this board to be very diverse. We want it to be transparent in its representation. We have established subcommittees. So the subcommittees are the ones that are actually going to have more work to do when they start um, focusing in on those assessments. And the other thing is that this is a non-regulatory council. In order for the Illinois Invasive Species Council to convene or reconvene, it's actually a little bit different, so I don't call it necessarily reconvening, we needed to make sure that we could move forward. And based on uh, resource constraints and budgets, you know, there was some discussion as to whether or not we went the regulatory route. And if we did, would there be a line item for that? And honestly, you know, I think we decided as a group that we were going to go all volunteers so that we would minimize any barriers, if you will, to moving forward. And for the most part, everybody was in agreement with it. So we're super excited about that. And the only thing that we need to do is we need to finalize the structure. So we had a wonderful forum in December and we had over 40 presentations over four and a half hours. And it was a wonderful update of what work and research is going on in the state of Illinois. So it was all taxa. So again, we got a chance to sit back and take a look at what that structure would look like. We have chosen representation. I, I think we're in the process right now of doing invitations and, and asking people if they were willing to, to gather. And the last thing that we need to do is set up a meeting date. So it's so exciting to know that Three and a half years of worth of work really, truly has paid off. And we're very excited. We're very happy about the way this came about, the support that we have within our agencies, the Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the Illinois chapter, and then Department of Natural Resources, and then all of our land managers. So all I can say really, truly is there's more to come, but I'm here to answer any of the questions. This is a real short synopsis of the work that's been done over the last, you know, three, three and a half years. But we thought it was a really good story. We thought it was a very hopeful story. So if you're interested and you want to talk a little bit about the pros and cons, I would be happy to answer your questions at the end of the discussion, or you can feel free to reach out to me and I can provide my uh, contact information. So with that, I am going to thank Lydia Scott, who's the director of the Chicago Region Trees Initiative, Chris Evans, East University of Illinois Forestry Extension, and Scott Shermer. The four of us have made kind of a smaller subgroup, if you will, and Lydia has been really, truly keeping us all together. She's the glue that holds everything together. So I could not have done it without them, and a lot of the material and some of the photographs that you see are from Chris Evans as well. So a big shout out to him. Okay, thank you so much, Tricia. That was outstanding. We are just a minute ahead, and I have one question for you if you're available. How do you counter the argument of those who say that due to global warming, non-native species are bound to proliferate? So how do you, you know, talk to decision makers about why it's important to keep them at bay? Why is it important to keep the invasive species at bay? Yeah. But, yeah. Is that... Is that, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, it, it, early detection and a rapid response is so much better than trying to eradicate it or manage it when it's already established. And, and I think that one of the things that we tried to do is to be very open with our elected officials in sharing kind of the budget implications, the ecological impl implications, and kind of letting people, you know what, if you take care of it before it becomes an issue, you know, we're much better off. And we have examples of that. I mean, I think Emerald Ash Borer is a huge example of, of you know, the challenges and, and the costs associated with trying to manage a species once it's established. In 
in an area. So I think we try to hit them on the on both fronts, on many fronts, to be honest with you. I think the budget is the one thing that they always listen to and constituents, you know, constituents want to live in a in a healthy, happy habitat or, a, you know, a healthy, healthy community. So. Great. Well, let's uh, get on to our next speaker then, Brendan Kirian with Cornell University. His presentation is titled, The Impacts of Insects and Disease on Carbon Sequestration. For the past decade, Brendan has worked for the Nature Conservancy's award-winning Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program, first as Terrestrial Project Coordinator and then as Program Director. Through this experience, he developed a keen interest in evaluating whether commonly applied natural resource management practices sufficiently meet ecological and societal objectives. In fall of 2019, he transitioned to Cornell University to advance research related to promoting improved outcomes and accountability in invasive species and white-tailed deer management. We're so happy to have you here with us today, Brendan. Thank you, Elizabeth. So welcome everyone, happy NYSA. Today I'm gonna to be talking about the impacts of insect and disease disturbance on live tree carbon sequestration. And before I, I dive deep into that, I wanna just pose a simple question to you all. And that is, what do you see when you look at this photo? I think many of you would say, we see a, a pretty picture, we see a pretty view, we see some nice mountains and lakes. But what I hope you will start seeing by the end of this presentation is one of the most important allies we have in combating global climate change. And that's the trees, the forests. So let's, let's go into this a little bit more. It all comes down to this chemical equation, the chemical equation for photosynthesis, where large amounts of carbon dioxide are removed from the atmosphere and sequestered in plant materials into organic carbon. Now trees are especially important in this regard for one main reason. They sequester large amounts of carbon into wood biomass, both in their above ground materials and their below ground materials, their trunk, trunks, their branches, and their roots. And these wood materials persist for extended periods of time, centuries on the landscape and act as a storage mechanism for all this carbon that we put into the atmosphere. And for this reason, other researchers have identified reforestation, avoided forest conversion, and natural forest management as having the greatest potential to mitigate global climate change. This is a study by Bronson Griscom et al. with the Nature Conservancy, and it's titled Natural Climate Solutions, if you're interested in learning more. Now, intuition would tell us that anything that reduces a plant or a tree's ability to photosynthesize will limit its ability to sequester carbon. And those disturbances can be geologic, they can be fire, they can be blowdown events, herbivory, or competing vegetation. They can also be forest pests and pathogens. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. So let's, let's look through some examples of this. I'm gonna start out with a scenario based on a native pest. But we'll, we'll talk about just a simple pine bark beetle here. And what you're seeing on the, on the graph right here is the biomass and sequestration potential of the forest over time. And so at pre-attack levels, a forest that's kind of at its climax state is kind of at a stable level of sequestration and a stable level of biomass. Once a native pest comes into the picture, it starts taking out those weak, old, sick and dying trees. And for a very short period of time, you know, as those trees that need to be removed from the system are killed, sequestration will go down for a period. But then as regeneration occurs in that gap opening, sequestration increases back to where it was to um, pre-attack levels. So your post-attack levels are very similar in the end to your pre-attack levels. And this is under normal conditions here. We're not talking about natives that are being um, exacerbated by climate change here. We're just talking about this is a native system, our uh, natural system where native insects are removing those sick, injured or dying trees. Now let's talk about an instance where a non-native specialist insect is brought into the picture, something like emerald ash borer. Same situation here where sequestration and biomass is fairly stable at the onset. 
the non-native is introduced, those tree species that that non-native feeds on are removed from the system. Recovery occurs, but the difference here is that that tree species that that non-native attacked is no longer present on the landscape to replace itself. In most cases, this is what's, what happens. So if an ash is killed by emerald ash borer, most likely ash is not going to be what replaces it. And in this instance, the long-term sequestration and biomass potential of that forest depends on what replaces ash. It could be lower or higher depending on the, the productivity and maximum achieved biomass of that tree species that replaces it. Now let's think about an example where a generalist pest comes into the picture, something like Asian longhorn beetle. In this instance, it attacks multiple species of trees very quickly. And you have large amounts of mortality happening in short periods of time. So in this instance, regeneration can't keep up with the amount of mortality happening. And you have extended periods of time with reduced sequestration and biomass. And in these instances, a forest can actually con convert from being a carbon sink to a carbon source. They're actually emitting carbon back out into the atmosphere. Now there's one other scenario here that's kind of the worst case scenario in my, my opinion, and it's the accumulation scenario. As forest pests and pathogens accumulate on a landscape, you can actually run into a similar situation as Asian longhorn beetle, depending on how quickly that accumulation occurs. So let's say in year one, a pest is introduced. Several years later, another pest is introduced. Several years after that, another pest is introduced and you wind up with almost a near identical situation as you would with Asian longhorn beetle, where you have large numbers of trees dying on the landscape all at once and they no longer serve as a carbon sink, but a, a carbon source. Now this is, this is um, a little bit unrealistic um, right now at least, but the point here is that the sequestration of a potential of a forest and the disturbances affecting it are not just a function of the intensity of that disturbance, but the frequency of that disturbance. If you have high frequency disturbance happening on a landscape, it can actually be like you having a very high intensity disturbance event. So now let's look at some of the facts um, surrounding forest pests and pathogens in the United States. So we know that forest pests and pathogens have been accumulating in the United States for the past 150 years. This is a study from Liebold et al in 2013. And you can see that forest pests have been accumulating primarily in the northeastern United States and western United States in areas that are trade hubs. They're being brought in from other places of the world on wood packaging material and ornamental plants. And from there, they spread into our forests and throughout the continent. We also know that native pests and pathogens are becoming more severe as a result of climate change. This is a map of mountain pine beetle tree death in the Western United States. And because we're experiencing warming, we're not getting the severe winters needed to knock back these pine beetle populations so that they don't have these devastating impacts on our forests. We also know that the trends don't look good as far as what the future holds for non-native pests and pathogens. This is from three different studies evaluating the accumulation of forest pests and pathogens over time. The first one, Alchema et al, shows that the all insect pests continues to rise. And for wood borers, actually the rate of, of um, introduction is increasing in recent decades. Similarly with Boyd et al, we're seeing a continued rise in the number of pests and pathogens that continue to be introduced into North America. And even if we project out into the future with modeling exercises, if we maintain the status quo, with ISPM 15 as our primary mechanism of defense for preventing the introduction and spread of non-native forest pests and pathogens, our numbers will continue to rise. So the key takeaway here is that under the current situation, more non-native insects and diseases are on the way. It's just a matter of time. So this, was, this is essentially what led to this research project that I'm gonna be talking about today. So this was a collaboration that actually started when I was working for the Nature Conservancy and before I transitioned to Cornell University. 
But the key questions that I had were, has recent insect and disease disturbance reduced the capacity of U.S. forests to sequester carbon? If so, by how much? And has recent disturbance from non-native insects and diseases resulted in greater reductions in carbon sequestration than native species? And I just want to thank my collaborators on this project. You're going to be hearing from Gary Lovett here in a little bit, but I just want to give credit to everyone that helped on this project. And these results that I'm sharing are representative of all the work that they put into it. So the data that we utilized to answer these questions was from the U.S. National Forest Inventory. If you're not familiar with the U.S. National Forest Inventory, it's administered by the United States Forest Service, and it's one of the most intensive forest monitoring programs on the planet. This is just a map that shows the forests across the United States. And the next picture I'm going to show is the plot intensity of the NFI plots on the landscape. It actually is kind of hard to comprehend, but the, the black dots on this map are all NFI plots. So the dark, darkest areas of, of these states, that's the intensity of monitoring that's occurring across these forests. And um, so those states that have more yellow, the intensity of monitoring is not as, as great. And overall, there are over 130,000 plots on forest land, nearly 200,000 on non-forest land for a total of over 315,000 plots across the United States. And this is what that plot design looks like. So every um, five years, plots are revisited. So about 20% of the plots in a state are measured each year. Each plot is randomly placed on the landscape and are separated by about 2,400 acre or hectares. And each plot is comprised of four smaller subplots that record things like vegetation, soils, downwoody debris. But what we were primarily interested in is the biomass measurements for these plots. And we classified carbon sequestration capacity as the estimated average annual rate of change or rate of carbon accumulation in biomass in live trees greater than 2.5 centimeters on unharvested forest land. Now that, that sounds complicated, but it's really not. What we were doing is we look at the initial measurement of trees on a particular plot then that same plot is measured again several years later, and the biomass is recorded. We take the difference in biomass between those two measurements, divide it by the number of years in between those two measurements, and that gives us an average annual rate of change, whether positive or negative. And for this particular study, we were looking at the most recent measurement interval from 2001 to 2019. So most of our plots had um, at least seven or eight years in between those measurements that we were, we were looking at. And the final metric here is in megagrams carbon per hectare per year. We wanted to see if this, the megagrams of carbon was increasing on these plots or decreasing, especially as they were associated with disturbance types. We also used another database called the Alien Forest Pest Explorer database. This is another um, data system administered by the USDA Forest Service. And it provides the county level distribution of non-native forest pests and pathogens across the United States. And for this particular study, we were only interested in the top 12 most damaging insects and diseases that had not yet reached their entire host range of the tree species that they, they attack. The reason we had to do that is because if you try to do something with, say, American chestnut or Dutch elm disease, it's already spread throughout its entire host range and you have nothing to compare against essentially. So we had to utilize species that um, had not reached their entire host range so that we had information on what, what it, areas not attacked look like. So this is what the experimental design looks like, or the observational study looks like. So red counties indicate infested areas by the top 12 non-native forest pest and pathogens. Blue counties represent counties uninfested by the non-native pests and pathogens. And on top of that, we have our National Forest Inventory plots. So um, we classified each one of these plots based on the greatest proportion of disturbance affecting that plot. So in white, we have plots with no disturbance recorded. In gray, we have plots with disease disturbance recorded. And in black, we have plots with insect disturbance recorded. Now, it's important to um, remember that a disturbance type 
is recorded when there's evidence of mortality or damage to 25% of the trees or 50% of an individual species count since the last measurement and the disturbance is at least 0.4 hectares in size. This will come, become important later on in the presentation when we talk about some of the um, outcomes of this research. So let's go back to our first question here. I'm not gonna share with you the statistical analysis that we did to um, generate these estimates and these maps, but I'm gonna dive right into the results for the sake of time. So has insect and disease disturbance reduced the capacity of US forests to sequester carbon? Let's look at what the United States looks like for plots that are not disturbed. So these are areas representing numerous aggregated national forest inventory plots that have no disturbance. And what is being shown is the mean change in megagrams carbon per hectare per year. So you'll see that for the most part, plots with no disturbance affecting them are sequestering carbon. They're in these light blue to green levels, which is great. That's what we would expect to see. The other thing I want to mention real quick is that we didn't have remeasurement data for the Rocky Mountain states to include in this analysis, at least for the most recent remeasurement interval. So we could not utilize data from the Rocky Mountain states to generate our estimates. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit. Now let's look at insect disturbance. We can see for that same map and the plots that are insect disturbed that we're seeing much, many more areas that are in these brown categories, which are not sequestering as much carbon as they should be. And we can kind of see that these, are, these coincide with where we think major forest pests and pathogens would be. So this area tends to coincide with the distribution of emerald ash borer. And over here in the Pacific Northwest, this tends to coincide with the distribution of mountain pine beetle, which is a native. If we look at disease, similar situation where mo more areas are in those um, light brown to dark brown levels, but not nearly as much as insects. So I think we can say yes to our first question here. Insects and disease disturbance reduce the capacity of U.S. forests to sequester carbon. But the next question is by how much? Does it really matter? So then we estimated the average annual rate, and rate of change in live tree biomass of NFI plots based on the disturbance types classified for each. And what we found is that plots with no disturbance sequestered about 1.44 megagrams of carbon per hectare per year. Disease disturbed plots sequestered 1.04. And insect disturbed plots on average sequestered 0.45 megagrams per carbon per year. So what, what does that really mean? So if we consider plots with no disturbance as kind of having their 100% capacity to sequester carbon from the atmosphere, that means that disease disturbed plots are only about 72% of that capacity and insect disturbed plots are only about 31% of that capacity. We then wanted to evaluate this nationally. How much is being lost in carbon sequestration potential across the United States? And for this, we did pull in data from the Rocky Mountain states, but it was based on the most recent measurement. So this is not representative of essentially the most current information, unfortunately. These other areas of the United States are. It's based on the most recent measurement that occurred within 2001 to 2019. So the Maybe I should say that a little bit differently. The Rocky Mountain states were based on like 2001 data, whereas all of these other plots were based on like 2018, 2019 data. So there's a little bit of a temporal difference here. And what we found is that nationally, insect disturbance reduced carbon sequestration potential by about 9.53 teragrams of carbon per year. So this is a different unit here. If you're not familiar, one um, teragram of carbon is one million megagrams of carbon. And disease disturbance reduced carbon sequestration by 3.55 teragrams carbon per year for a total of about a 13.1 teragrams carbon per year reduction. So what's the context behind that? Let's, let's put this in simpler terms. So that's equivalent to reducing the total US forest carbon sequestration by about 9% annually. 
It's also equivalent to adding the carbon emissions from over 10 million passenger vehicles annually. So hopefully that gives you a better sense of the magnitude that we're, we're dealing with here and this disturbance on the landscape. We also feel like these estimates are fairly conservative, and there's two reasons for this. The first one is based on the National Forest Inventory's definition of disturbance, which does not account for low-intensity disturbance events, as I mentioned earlier. It's a pretty significant disturbance that has to occur for it to be recorded as insect or disease disturbance. So we're missing those low intensity disturbance events. The second reason is because we lacked remeasurement data from the Rocky Mountain states, which we know to be heavily impacted by insects and diseases. So if we anticipate that if we had that data, our estimates for insect and disease disturbed plots would actually be lower than they, they actually are. Okay, for the last question that I posed is, has disturbance from non-native insects and diseases resulted in greater reductions in carbon sequestration than native species? And this was kind of surprising for us. We actually could detect no significant difference between native and non-native pests and the reductions that they cause. Now, it's important to clarify this. This does not mean that non-natives are not having an impact. We already addressed, addressed that question with, our, with the first analysis. The National Forest Inventory doesn't differentiate between native and non-native pests, so our analysis should be indicative of both. Both non-natives and natives are affecting those estimates. There's several other important reasons why we feel like additional research is needed here, though. The first one is the spatial resolution of the AFPE database. It may be too coarse to pick up on these signals. So, for example, if you had a county that was infested by emerald ash borer, unless your National Forest inventory plot was in an ash forest, it wouldn't be recorded as having insect disturbance. So we need high resolution data that ideally coincides with the National Forest inventory to really do this well. We also know that non-native species have tended to accumulate in forests with higher productivity, which could be a confounding factor in the analysis here. They are accumulating in the Northeastern United States, which have higher productivity forests than the um, rest of the United States. And we also know that climate change could be making native species more similar to non-natives, which would make it extremely difficult to try and find a difference between invasives and non-natives. If natives are acting more like invasives, we're not gonna pick up on a difference here. We also had to think about some mismatch in the invasion histories and the National Forest Inventory Remeasurement Intervals. So I, as I mentioned, our Remeasurement intervals fell from 2001 to 2019, whereas we know many of these top 12 non-native forest pests and pathogens have been on the landscape much, much longer than that. So they have, may have moved through some of these forests, which are now recovering. And lastly, we only evaluated the top 12 most damaging when we know there are many more on the landscape. So again, we hope this spurs additional discussion and research because we think it's important to get at the mechanisms behind native and non-native disturbance and how they affect carbon sequestration. So the implications of this are, are broad and I unfortunately I don't have the time to go through much of this. Luckily our next presenter, Gary Lovett, is going to touch on one of the most important implications in my, my opinion, which is non-native forest pest and pathogen prevention. But some of the things I want to leave you with are, this is not just a carbon story, this is a, a human health story. This is an economic story. This is a biodiversity story. There are many co-benefits preventing non-native forest pests and pathogens, as well as managing native species impacts. And the other thing is there's broad implications for forest management, especially for the native pests and pathogens that are affecting the landscape. We know that the natives are fairly stable as far as accumulation, so we're not going to get more native species, but we still need to do something about those ones that are here and are causing impacts. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Elizabeth. Wow, thank you so much, Brendan. That was incredibly interesting. Okay, our next and final speaker of today's webinar is Dr. Gary Lovett, Senior Scientist Emeritus at Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. 
Dr. Lovett received his bachelor's degree in biology from Union College and a PhD in biology from Dartmouth College. Gary's research focuses primarily on the effects of air pollution, climate change, and invasive species and diseases on forests. He is the author of over 140 scientific publications and editor of two books. And he has been elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a fellow of the Ecological Society of America. He recently convened a group of leading scientists to study the ecological and economic impacts of invasive forest pests and to recommend policy options to reduce pest importations in international trade. He has been actively engaged with federal agencies and private companies to address this issue. I know from our previous webinars, this is a topic that people are thinking about and they're hungry for information on how to prevent invasive species from being brought into the country. So thank you for being here. Gary's presentation is titled The Tree Smart Trade, How to Prevent Invasive Forest Pests and Pathogens from Entering the United States. Go ahead and share your screen and you have the stage. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for that introduction. And, and thank you to NASMA for, for hosting this series of webinars uh, that you had this week. And particularly for this set of, of webinars that we're having today, it's just a, a really important topic. I'm very glad to be here. And I just want to thank NASMA for their leadership on this issue. So as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm going to be talking a bit about what we can do to stop invasive forest pests and pathogens from entering the U.S. Before I start, let me just say, for those of you who don't know the Cary Institute, it's a nonprofit ecological research and education center. We're in New York State in, in the Hudson Valley, so we're just an independent ecological research center. I want to pick up sort of where, where Brendan left off. I'm going to show you actually some of the same sort of data that he showed. He talked about the fact that native pests or the number of native pests is sort of fixed in, in the, in the uh, country, but the number of invasive pests is going up. So I want to, you know, so that, that's, he was talking particularly about what's happening with carbon sequestration, but I want to sort of zoom out a little bit and talk about what are the overall impacts of invasive forest pests on, on the U.S., the ecological and economic impacts. And I want to talk a little bit about what we can do about it. So there's a lot of great science to be done here. And Brendan just talked about some of it. We're learning new things all the time about the impacts of these invasive forest pests. And of course, every time there's a new pest into the, that comes into the country, we have more research we need to do. But we do know a lot and we know enough to act. And so I, I want to go through just quickly some things that we do know and then what we can do to stop them. So as, as Brendan mentioned, this is not a new problem. The number of insect pests has been accumulating in the country for a long period of time. This graph is from Akama et al. We replotted it in the, in the paper that we did in 2016. But you can see this, this red uh, line here shows the accumulation of all insect pests in the U.S. And this is a cumulative number of pests over time. It's been going up since 1850 or so. And it's been going up at a fairly stable level, so very steady level. That's about 2.6 per year, about 26 new pests per decade. The wood boring insects, which are the brown line here down at the bottom, were also going up at a, so that's a subset of these insect pests. They were going up at a, at a fairly steady rate also until about the 1980s. And that, then the slope increased. We started getting more, a great, greater rate of introduction of, of wood boring pests into the country. And we know the reason for that. The reason is that we have increased the rate of containerized shipping. Like most of our goods are being transported internationally on these huge container ships. Inside those shipping containers uh, is wood packaging material like crates and pallets. And wood boring insects can be bored inside that wood packaging material. So they get into the wood packaging in the place where the shipment originates. It's brought to the U.S. The container is open. The insects uh, or the, the pallets are brought out. The insects get out and boom, we've got a problem. So this advent of our increase in containerized shipping has has really affected the rate of wood borers coming into the country. So what do we know? We know that this is a continuing problem and it doesn't seem to be getting any better. In fact, it seems to be getting worse. We know, as Brendan said, that this is a problem throughout the whole country. 
Pretty much anywhere there's a forest, there's a forest pest problem. As he pointed out, the problem is worse in the uh, Northeast and Upper Midwest and also in California. But the, these numbers, by the way, are the number of forest pests per state. So, you know, any, pretty much all of our states have a, have a significant forest pest problem. So I'm in New York State where we have it worse than anybody. And these numbers came from, I think it was 2015 or 2014, something like that, the U.S. Forest Service data. We, and we've had a few more pests enter New York State since then, the spotted lanternfly, the beech leaf disease. So these numbers continue to go up. So we know it's a continuing problem. We know it's a widespread problem. And, you know, depending on where you are in the country, you have your own, you know about what pests are in your area. If you're in California, it's the uh, sudden oak death or the polyphagous sh uh, shot hole borers that are in Southern California. If you're in the Southeast, you're worried about laurel wilt. If you're in the Appalachians, you're worried about, worried about hemlock woolly adelgid. In the North, it's maybe gypsy moth or beech bark disease. And of course, throughout most of the country, it's emerald ash borer. There's, there's just a lot of these pests and where you are depends is determining which pests you're particularly worried about. We know something about who pays for this and how much. And this was a bit of a surprise to me. This was a study also done by Akama et al. This one went out in 2011. And it isn't the final word on this, on this issue, but it, it was a good start at this, this analysis. I'm trying to rearrange my screen here so I can see this. So what it shows is that the cost of just the insect pests here, this does not include the diseases, they, the annual cost of uh, imported insect pests, it's, it's on the order of four to five billion per dollar per year. But, and this is in the US, but you think, well, so these are forest pests, you'd think it would be the forest products industry that's suffering the most, but no, it's not timber owners that are really paying the price here. It's not the federal government. It's really homeowners and local governments that are paying that price. And they're paying, the, they're suffering the, the greatest cost to these insect pests. And so that was a surprise to me. It's a little bit uh, counterintuitive, but when you think about it a bit, if a tree dies in a forest, you lose the value of the tree. But if a tree dies on your property, or if it dies on a city street, then it has to be taken down and that costs a lot of money. And so that's a, a large part of the costs that, were, that are being incurred as a result of these forest pest invasions. And the costs are being incurred by city governments that have to take them down. Homeowners have to take down trees as well. So that costs quite a bit of money. But homeowners are getting a double whammy actually, because not only do they have to take down the dead tree, but they lose property value when they lose a big tree like like that. So it's really homeowners and local governments that are paying the major cost of this. And we know this is an underestimate. It doesn't include the diseases, for instance. It doesn't include any of the non-market values of things that trees do for us. Cleaning the air, cleaning the water, lowering our cooling bills, just aesthetic and recreational values doesn't include, doesn't include any of that. So this is strictly the easy to measure economic costs, and it's quite a bit. We know that you can't express the impact on communities simply uh, by dollars either. And I think we can express this e most easily in pictures like this rather than in numbers. So the top pair of photos is from Toledo, Ohio. It's a street that was attacked by the Emerald Ash Board. You can see the before and after picture of the dead ash trees along that street. Uh, the bottom pair of photos is from Worcester, Massachusetts. It's a street that was lined with maple trees. Those maple trees had to be removed because of the Asian longhorn beetle, an infestation of the Asian longhorn beetle in that town. So I think you can understand that if you lived on these, street, in these streets, on these, in these cities, it's not really just an economic issue. It's a community character. It's a quality of life issue. And, and, and as I mentioned before, these trees are also helping to cool the cities. They're helping with storm water, water runoff. And there's all sorts of services, benefits that they offer the city that we're losing when we, we lose them to these pests. We know that there's a lot of ecological impacts and I'm an ecologist, so I could talk about this all day, but I won't. So I just wanna, there's one main point that we need to get across here and that they, these introduced pests are the only threat that can reduce major tree species to ecological insignificance in a matter of decades. And I put these images of American chestnut up here that because that's sort of the, the prime example, the poster child of, of where that's happened. As you know, chestnut used to be a dominant tree species, in many cases, the dominant tree species throughout much of the Eastern US, throughout the Mid-Atlantic and, and Upper Southeast into New England. 
But a, a chestnut blight and introduced disease was introduced in 1904 and spread within, within a few decades throughout the whole range of chestnut and killed all those trees. The picture on the right here is a picture from 1910 in North Carolina. So you can see the size of these trees and why they dominated the forest. Right, so I put the picture up just to remind us of what we have to lose. And, and, I, and I'll say that this happened to chestnut in the last century. This is exactly what's happening to ash right now, and possibly also to eastern hemlock on a somewhat slower time scale. The ecological impacts are not limited to the tree species itself. And a great example of that is the hemlock woolly adelgid because there's been a lot of research done on it. This is a tiny insect from Asia. It was introduced probably in the early 1900s to Virginia. It wasn't really discovered until 1952 in Virginia. And it's continued to spread throughout the uh, southeastern US and up into the mid-Atlantic into New England. It's now just gotten into the Adirondacks in northern, northern New York. And you can see this picture in the upper left, this tiny black dot at the base of the needle is, is an adelgid. It's basically a sucking insect like an aphid, and it targets a particular type of cell within the, within the twig and so basically sucks the nutrients out of that. And of course, a few of those wouldn't bother the hemlock tree, but if you get millions and millions of them on a hemlock tree, it will eventually kill it. Hemlocks, eastern hemlocks, are one of our major old growth species. They dominate a forest stand because they cast a deep shade. Those of you who have been in hemlock stands know that the character of hemlock stands is unique and it's something that we don't want to lose. But it kills those trees, kills those huge trees, and when it does that, it has a number of impacts that reverberate through the ecosystem. It releases plants, understory plants, young, you know, successional plants, but it also releases invasive species. I've seen in several studies that invasive species, invasive plant species come into the stand when the hemlocks are killed due to the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. It changes carbon storage and, and nutrient retention. Brendan just talked a lot about its ability to reduce carbon storage, pests in general. And the same is true with nutrient retention, things like nitrogen, or the forest acts as a sponge to take pollutant nitrogen out of the air and not bring it into our drinking water. When the trees die, you lose that capacity. It's associated with the decline of some bird species like this black-throated green warbler. A study in Connecticut showed a 93% decline in, in black-throated green warblers when the hemlocks died in a stand. And hemlocks are also important because they often grow along streams. Uh, and because they cast a deep shade, they keep the stream cool, and that provides an important habitat for cold water fish species like the brook trout that you see down here on the left. So embedded ecosystems are also impacted as the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid affects the forest. So my point here is we know that not only does the, do these invasive pests, can they decimate a tree species, but they change everything about the forest in the process of doing that. And we also know that these can last for centuries. We're doing modeling work that shows that because the invasive pest changes the tree species composition and the tree species composition controls the, the nature of the soils and those soils, its carbon can be stored for hundreds or even thousands of years in those soils, that these impacts of these changes in tree species composition can last for centuries, sometimes even millennia. So that I want to move on uh, to talk about whether this problem can be solved or not. Here's a couple of other things we know that we know, we know that eradication of established pests is virtually impossible. Uh, you can manage them, you can control them sometimes, but it's almost impossible to, to eradicate them. So biological control has potential, but it is difficult. It is sometimes risky. And particularly with forest pests, it's shown itself to be only occasionally successful. So it's by no means a sure thing. So based on those things, it seems to make most sense to keep invasive pests out of the country in the first place, rather than trying to deal with them after they're already here. And that we know that it's federal policies that control the importation and establishment of, of new forest pests. It's not, there isn't much that states can do by themselves. It's really a federal government problem. So when we're talking about policies, we, we need to set our priorities. And that tells you uh, basically what I've said so far, tells you where the priorities we think, where we think they ought to be. First of all, the priorities ought to be on prevention of importation and establishment because we need to keep them out of the country in order to save the ecological damage. And also because it's a whole lot cheaper to try to keep them out of the country than to all the damage that's to try to deal with all the damage that's done. 
And we need to focus on the major pathways of introduction. We can't do this species by species. We need to focus on the main ways that they get into the country. And we know what the major pathways of introduction are. We know that most of the, historically, most of the forest pests that have come into the country have come in on live woody plants for, that are brought in for landscaping, for the nurse, nursery industry. And as I mentioned before, more recently, a solid wood packaging uh, material has also become a very important vector. And in fact, 90% of the most damaging insects brought in recently have come on solid wood packaging material. So those are our two main pathways, our two main vectors, and those are the things that we ought to focus on. I'll say that there are other pathways. There are things like, you know, rustic furniture that's being brought in. There's, you know, some that are brought in on logs and so forth, but really these are the main actors. So we need to focus our policies on these. We know that we have current policies in place, actually, to prevent or to at least reduce the, the pests that are in these two different pathways. But unfortunately, those, those policies we know from studies are inadequate. So let's start with the live plant imports. In order to import a live plant, that live plant has to have a certificate of, let's say, cleanliness from uh, the exporting country, and it has to pass through an inspection station in the U.S., I think there are 17 different inspection stations in the U.S. The problem is an analysis of that system has shown that it's about 28% efficient in catching introduced pests that are coming in on plants. And there are two reasons for that. One is that there are so many live plant imports. There's something like two and a half billion live plants brought into the country every year. We can only inspect a small percentage of them. In fact, there are only, at least in the, in the study that Liebhold et al. did, there were only 65 plant inspectors like this guy. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not throwing shade on this guy. I'm sure he does a great job, but he just has an overwhelming job to do. He's got to, you know, to try to inspect that many plants coming in. In fact, only one to 2% of them are inspected. And, you know, the other thing is that the, these things are hard to see, right? You, you have a, the life stage of a, of a disease or an insect might not be visible to the naked eye. So visual inspection is not a great way to go. And then we have wood packaging material. The, the regulation for wood packaging material is that any wood packing material that's shipped internationally is supposed to be treated to reduce insects. It's a particular standard. Brendan mentioned it. It's called ISPM 15. And it requires that the wood packaging material either be heat treated or fumigated to kill the insects before it's shipped internationally. And then it has to be stamped to say that that happened. And this is what the stamp looks like on, the, on a wooden pallet. There's been a study also done of how efficient that uh, is, and it found that it's about 36 to 52 percent effective in reducing the infestation of wood packaging material. And so, okay, so it helped that establishing that standard helped, but 36 to 52 percent effective is not all that great, particularly when the rate of, of the volume of, of trade is increasing all the time. And the authors of this study, Hack et al., went on to calculate that with this 36 to 52 percent effectiveness and with the number of you know shipments of you know, shipping containers coming into the country every year it's allowing approximately 13,000 potential introductions of new wood boring pests each year so does that policy help yes is it sufficient no Okay, and another point that we know we want to make an important point about is that inspection at the ports is necessary, but it's not sufficient. As I said, there's still something like 25 million shipping containers coming into the, into the uh, U.S. every year, and only a couple percent of those can be inspected. Customs and Border Protection actually does the inspections at the ports, and they do, they do a great job at that. But wood-boring insects are hard to find. You know, just think about that. You're trying to find an insect that's in a board, that's in a pallet, that's at the bottom of a shipping container on a ship that's full of shipping containers. So it's just a just an incredible inspection problem. It is, however, really, and we're, and we're never going to inspect our way out of this problem. But it, it is very important, however, because it is our deterrent. Uh, this represents the cop with the radar gun on the highway. It doesn't have to catch every single car. It doesn't have to be everywhere. He can just the fact that he may be out there slows all traffic down. And, and inspection does the same thing for pests coming into the country. It also provides crucial data about where these pests are coming from. So it's a sampling system to see what kind of commodities and what countries are sending us wood packaging material with pests. So inspection is, is very important. 
So we came up with a, a series of five policy actions that we think will help prevent new forest pest invasions. We call it tree smart trade, and I'm just gonna go through it real quickly here. One is that we need to switch to pest-free packaging material for international shipments. That kind of makes sense based on what I've told you before. This is not an easy lift, right? Because nearly all of our material that's shipped internationally is on pallets and something like over 90% of those pallets are made of wood, solid wood. So this would be a big change. There are things we can do to try to beef up the, the pest-free part of this without necessarily eliminating solid wood from the, from the process. We need to restrict the importation of live plants, particularly those live plants that are that share a genus with native plants of North America, because those are the imported plants that are most likely to transmit an insect or a disease to our native plants. So we shouldn't be importing plants that are congeneric with North American species. We need to expand our early detection and rapid response programs so that we can catch outbreaks while they're still small before they start to grow and then we can't deal with them anymore. So we need to have surveillance and rapid response that can pick up the, the potential outbreaks and eliminate them early. We need to tighten enforcement of current regulations. I'll talk a little bit more about that before. A little of that has happened already and it's been extremely effective. So this is something that we can really do to try, particularly with the wood packaging, to try to increase the enforcement to gain better compliance with the, the current wood packaging regulations. And lastly, we have to expand our international pest prevention programs with our trading partners so that we can be sure that the shipments are clean before they get on the ship. And so we don't have to try to deal with it coming into the ports in the U.S. So those are five general policy things that are policy actions that need to be taken. We've put those in a policy brief. And you can get this policy brief in at this website here, www.treesmarttrade.org. And if you go through this policy brief, it gives you a lot more detail on exactly what needs to be done by what agency. So it's not, I just gave you the general overview. This gives you the details. So I'd urge you to go ahead and get that. So we've had some recent successes here. And so I don't want to give you the idea that this is an impossible problem. This is in fact quite a tractable problem. One of the most important ones is something that the US Customs and Border Protection did. It's in the line of what I was talking about uh, was increasing enforcement of, of these regulations. They put in place a new policy for more stringent enforcement of wood packaging regulations, and it's had a large impact. It has basically started, they've been issuing more fines to shippers that are bringing in wood packaging with, with pests in it. They also make those ships turn around, basically take the material out of the country. It's very expensive for the shippers. And I'll talk about the impact of that in just a moment. That was put in place in late 2017, uh, early 2018, and it's now uh, paying off. We put a provision in the 2018 Farm Bill that requires the USDA to do a comprehensive report on this issue and possible solutions. And that report is due March 1st, you know, in just a week or so. So we're very much looking forward to that, that report coming out. We'll see what USDA thinks that it can do to help solve this problem. And we hope it'll be a springboard to further action. And lastly, we're working with a coalition of shipping companies to develop voluntary measures to keep these pests out of wood packaging material. Because of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection policy change, all of a sudden it's, it's uh, costing these shipping uh, companies quite a bit if they're not in compliance with these wood packaging regulations. And so they're looking for ways to keep their supply chains clean. And they're coming up with some very creative ways to do that. So I think this is a great development. It's mobilizing the creativity of a private sector to try to solve this problem. So these are three very promising developments. What do we need to do? One thing we need for sure is more and better communication with the public, media, and policymakers. As we try to talk about this issue in Washington or with, with legislators or with federal agencies, particularly the, and with the public, particularly the legislators and the public are not really aware of the severity of the problem. And so we all need to communicate a little bit better about how this is a serious and urgent problem for our forests and cities, but it's a tractable problem. It's one that we can fix with some fairly straightforward policy 
changes, but those require federal action. And this is just a picture of us in the in the in one of the Senate offices buildings. This is Patrick Leahy's office. This is one of Patrick Leahy's staffers. And I just want to point out my colleagues, Kathy Fallon-Lambert and Marissa Weiss from the Science Policy Exchange, a group that helped us launch this effort and were very instrumental in the original uh, development of Tree Smart Trade. And this is Becky Turner from American Forest, an advocacy group that, that's been helping us out. So we need to have more and better communication. And we're trying to ramp that up a bit. We've produced a new video. I'm just going to show you this video. It's a minute and a half. We've got time to do that. It just It's a video that's meant to communicate with tree lovers, not so much with uh, invasive species professionals. But I want to show you how we're trying to communicate the issue to tree lovers. So I'm going to put this on. There's music in this video. There's no voice. Okay, so that, that was the video. Like I said, we're using that for communication with the public primarily. And I, I want to emphasize to end here that this problem can be solved, but we need everybody's help. We need you to speak up for stronger federal action. So if you have some ability to uh, talk to policymakers or talk to the public, make sure you make that point. If you need more information, go to treesmarttrade.org. You can follow us on Twitter. Please follow us on Twitter. We have a new campaign on, on the Asian longhorn beetle. Or you can contact me at that email address. That's okay. This is a really interesting discussion and <clears throat> Brendan and your presentations just really went so nicely together. So let's get everybody back, all of our presenters back on camera. Okay. Hi, Brendan. Welcome back. Hi, Tricia. Okay. We do have a couple of questions in the Q&A and we have been answering some of them as well. So thanks to our presenters for, for answering a few of them already. First step, we'll just stick with Gary here real quick. Which agency in the USDA is in charge of preparing the report you mentioned that is due on March 1st. It was primarily prepared by APHIS, which is the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. They are the group that really sets the rules for importation, you know, regulations on importation you know, of forest pests. So they did most of the, of the preparation. Of course, it went through agency review all the way up to the top. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, switching gears, Trisha, there is there are a few questions about the volunteer nature of the council. And so the first question is, even though it's all volunteer run and you have volunteer members, was there one agency that really did the majority of the work and who funded the council getting it set up? That's a good question. So if you're thinking about the past, the past it was the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. And going forward, we opted not to be under an agency. We wanted to move forward without funding. And I know everybody's like, why would you do that? We did that because it eliminated a lot of barriers. And we wanted to be fully transparent. We wanted to have all taxes represented. And we wanted the, the ability to be able to advocate and educate on behalf of many multiple agencies. And so we decided that in the near term for the next two to three years, we're going to lay out a number of goals. And if we meet those goals and we just determined that we need funding, then we feel confident that we could go back to either the Department of Agriculture or the Department of Natural Resources and ask for funding.
And I, I think you kind of answered the next question too, but along those same lines, do you believe that this gives you the teeth to make the decisions and, and provide the recommendations that are, were your goals with starting the council? Yeah, absolutely. We have representation, non-voting representation from the Illinois Department of Agriculture and the Illinois Department of Natural Resources on the Executive Council. So they will be working with all of us side by side in order to go through the assessments. So the assessments come up through the subcommittees and then they get reviewed and that reviewed becomes a recommendation and that recommendation then would go on for further action. Okay, back to Gary. What percentage of incoming shipments on wood pallets, for example, actually get inspected coming into the U.S.? That, that is a great question. We've, we've asked the CBP, Customs and Border Protection, what that percentage is, and they, they won't release the data exactly. We, we know it's a couple of percent, you know, less than 5% for sure. They target those inspections, so they try to go for the uh, countries and the commodities that have been in the past show, showing the worst infestation rates. So it, it's, it's really uh, just a couple of percent. Okay, thank you. And this question is for any of our presenters today. Are there implementation plans to replant native species where ash, hemlock, and beech are dying? Does any of our speakers know about if that if there if those exist? I can speak for Illinois. And so we have a program right now that we are moving into the second year. It's a dead ash tree removal uh, program. It's funded by the Forest Health, and it's really targeted for under-resourced areas. So where there's dead and dying ash trees, there's funds available to have those ash trees removed and pruned. And pruning is a huge part of this. And then there's a replacement program in you know, following the removal. So we are working on it. We hope to be able to expand that program within Illinois and, and, and to be honest with you, as it relates to the ash trees around the country. I, I think it's, it's really warranted. Many, many people don't just have the resources to do ash tree removal. And many of those ash trees are on private property and they are a risk when they do die. And, and we've seen it certainly with increased rain events and windstorms. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add to that that like like Tricia says, you know, for ash trees or hemlocks that die in cities, there's usually a, a replacement plan in you know, that that cities have to replace the street trees. That's expensive, but they, they do it. But most of the ash trees and hemlock trees are in the forest somewhere, and throughout most of the eastern U.S., that forest is uh, regenerating naturally. So. Generally, there's no planting that I know of in, in forests to try to replace those trees. It's just whatever comes back naturally. And I would just Thanks. bring up the Plant a Trillion Trees initiative that's happening across the country. And that's not necessarily planting after insect or disease disturbance, as Gary mentioned, but it's a great initiative to increase the amount of forests we have across the landscape. Mm. There is uh, the Arbor Day Foundation and Trees Forever are two good programs that are really invested in diversifying our urban canopies, as well as planting, reforesting after not only ash tree, but you know certain types of significant events, climatic events. Great, thank you. And that spurred a couple of other <laughs> other ash specific questions. Will pruning diseased ash trees help them survive? And what species are you replacing the ash with? And I guess, well, I'll let you answer. The only thing that's really been found to protect ash trees is injection by insecticides of some kind. Pruning won't protect your ash from being killed. I can talk a little bit about that. Our tree planting suggestions are to focus more locally. So looking at the tree species, what is that canopy that's in that area? So if you've been in an area subdivision that's lost a lot of ash and the only thing that's left is maple, you don't want to plant maple. So you want to make sure that you're diversifying locally. So thinking you know, really local and making sure that you've got that diversity level down you know, probably 20% diversification would be highly recommended. Okay, this again could be for any one of our speakers. How do all of the vast forest fires over the past decade alter or affect the pest species? 
You want to take it, Brendan, or you want me to take it? Maybe we can tag team it a little bit. I think it largely depends on the, the past of interest. We do expect these types of interactions to exist. If trees are dying in abundance across a landscape and adding that fuel load to the land, then of course fires could be more prevalent. But the reason we didn't really look into those interactions with the analysis that I shared is we were missing a lot of that data from the Rocky Mountain states where forest fires are so prevalent right now. So future research is needed on that. Mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, the, it's an interesting question because the, the question is usually asked the other way, to what extent are the pests affecting the forest fires? And there's been quite a bit of research on that, and it's spotty. In some places, increased pest infestation seems to increase the, the intensity or frequency of forest fires, but in a lot of places, there isn't much of an interaction. Both of those, in the, in the Western U.S., both of those are exacerbated by climate change, both the pest expansion and the forest fires, rather than being linked to one another. But you're asking the question, do the fires affect the pests? And I don't think anybody's really looked at that. I, I wouldn't expect it to be that much of an effect. Okay, Gary, on the U.S. map, why is Louisiana the lowest pest of 12 while they have major ports like New Orleans? Are they doing something that the rest of us don't know about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, you could ask the question, why is the Northeast so high? And I, I think it has to do both with the, the volume through the ports. And it also has, because these pests accumulate in ecosystems, it has to do with the history, how long these ports have been active. And so these ports in the Northeast, like Philadelphia and New York, have been ports since the 1600s, right? And we've been importing pests since at least the 1800s. So, and these have, and we're still dealing with pests that we imported in the 1800s. So, Louisiana is just, a, it's an increased actor in the field. And, you know, there's been recent studies that ports along Southeast, the, the traffic in those ports is increasing. So, you might expect, congratulations, those in the Southeast are going to get more pests in the future. Great, thank you. Okay, let's. This next one is for Tricia. So nice presentation. <laughs> that picture of the invasive pear is an example of one picture worth a thousand words. Wondering if Illinois has any experience with Chinese elm. Not that I'm aware of. I did see that, and and I was trying to uh, find out from my colleagues have we had an experience with it. But no, not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. Okay, and one more for Tricia. Does Illinois have an attack force made up of your ver the various agencies that take turns going out into the field and investigating uh, potential invasive species reports? What I'm aware of is that there's a strike team. So the Nature Conservancy has a strike team in Southern Illinois. Typically the strike teams are responses to storm damage, but there isn't a, a, a combined attack force, strike force, or strike team that goes out and does uh, their own surveillance and monitoring and reporting. So each agency has their own protocols that they follow. And our hope is that we could take that information and through the, universe, through the Illinois Invasive Species Council, create more of a clearinghouse so we have that information, the work that's being done on the ground. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take one more question for Gary. Can wood pellets be treated to destroy any wood boring insects or their eggs before leaving port? Yeah, so that was the point of that policy that I talked about, which and Brendan mentioned also called ISPM 15. So that's an international regulation that requires that wood packaging be either heat treated or fumigated to kill the pests inside it. Uh, there's a couple of problems though, and it, it does, as I pointed out, it doesn't really, it gets less than half of the, the pests. And, you know, one is that the treatment that's, that's indicated there probably doesn't get everything, you know, it gets 90%, but maybe not 100% of the pests that are in the, in the wood. And the other is, you know, it's not, it's not uniformly applied. In some cases, it's fraudulently, the, the, the material is fraudulently stamped and was never treated at all. And we have no ability to enforce that in other countries. So the only thing that we can do is try to inspect the material coming in. So it's an international policy that's supposed to be uh, protecting us, but it's not doing all that well. And it's largely because our trading partners are not as diligent as you might hope in enforcing it. 
Okay, well, I want to thank our panelists today. I'm just going to share my screen quickly and share just a couple of, of closing slides with you all. But please, wherever you are at in the world, give a virtual round of applause to our speakers. Stand up and give them a standing ovation. Just so appreciate the great information from today and a lot of good things that our legislative committee can start to talk about and start to move forward. One o'clock central with Lee Van Wyken with the Weed Science Society of America. It's called Show Me the Money, and we are going to talk about appropriations and how to get the authorizations in law funded. And again, for anyone uh, who wants to watch the recordings, they'll be available on NASMA's public YouTube channel. We are having just such a great time with NISA this year and getting ready right after this for, for our May NISA as well. Keep in mind, we also have our free monthly webinar series here at NASMA. So March 17th, we have a great presentation on non-native worms, earthworms, if you're interested in that. Go to NISA.org, download our resource toolkit, help us promote it. Like us on Facebook at Invasive Species Week. Like our page and, and follow along with us. Go to NISA.org, sign up for alerts and reminders. We welcome all sponsorships and donations. And again, join NASMA, participate on the Legislative Committee, and help us plan the next NISA event.